Good morning. Uh, you know, I'm out this week after what has been a almost a spring drought. We've had some unrealistically long periods of time where there was no rain. And then we hit a real heat dome, or at least that's what it was called, where our temperatures were up in the high 30s. That's Celsius. That's really unusual for us, especially it's still June. It hasn't even come into high summer yet. Now we've kind of run into a run of rain, which has been good for the woods, good for the plants, uh, but it means I really haven't spent any time in the woods in the last week or so. The good news is the fire ban may be lifted after two o'clock today. I may be able to have a fire to cook myself some lunch and make some coffee with or boil some water for coffee with. Yeah, so that's kind of what my plan is today. Now, this is a hike and a coffee video. And there are two things that I'm going to be covering. The coffee today is actually quite special. So please stay around until you hear what I have to say about the coffee I'll be making. And the second one is going to be something of a, how should I say, contentious issue. People can be very strongly positioned, very polarized on this issue, and actually can get very emotional about it. It's about using your knife for batoning. I'll tell you the reason why that subject today is, but using your knife for splitting wood. I mean, the question is, is, is it necessary? Is it stupid? Or is it a worthwhile skill to learn how to do? So that's what today's topic will be when we get to the discussion. In the meantime, I still got quite a ways to go to get to where I'm going to have my lunch and my coffee. So hopefully you'll follow along. So this flower hiding under the foliage is known as the lady slipper or moccasin flower. Native to Nova Scotia, usually a very spring flower, earlier spring. I'm surprised to see these still here. Uh, I guess because they're hiding in the shade, they can last a little longer. You can see they're already starting to brown on their leaves. So they, these won't be here for much longer. Very interesting plant. They have a unique way of reproducing, but for the most part, it's not by seed, it is by through the root system. And this is what makes this flower kind of unique. This flower will take up to 25 years to grow underground before it pops up out of the ground like you see here. They have a relationship with a fungi, a mycorrhizal fungi under the ground that is necessary for them to grow. They don't transplant. 99% of the time these die. They, if you cut them to take them home because they're so pretty, they die and can damage the plant. So knowing all of that, the question of the day I have is, are these protected here in Nova Scotia? And should they be protected if they're not? Put your answers in the comment section below. All right, I just finished my lunch. Another great meal prepared out here in the woods. Easy chicken cacciatore. Tasted great. And if you're interested, that'll be coming out under a separate video title at some point. So how do you follow up on a great meal? But of course, with a great cup of coffee. Now this is gonna surprise longtime viewers. The coffee I'm having today, it's not Rampage. It's something different, something special something my wife found for me and am I ever glad she bought it for me. It's made by a local organization known as Hope Blooms and Hope Blooms started here in Halifax in 2008 with a mission to work with inner city youth to teach them life skills and the way they did that is kind of unique as well. They created an urban farm on the grounds of an old school and they taught the kids not only how to plant uh, plants but how to bring them to harvest, how to turn them into products that they could then take to market. Now they have a lot of programs for the youth and the community at large, including creating food security for the community, teaching how to cook healthy yet economical meals and a number of other things. In fact, I will be putting the links to Hope Blooms in the video description so you can see what else they have going on. It's, it's an amazing story to say the least. Hope Blooms started out with their urban farm here in Halifax by growing herbs and those herbs were harvested by the young people 
turned into salad dressings, taken to market, and all the profits brought back into the organization itself. Now, of course, they've expanded their list of products availability. They also have tea, I believe hot chocolate, and now, of course, coffee. Not just any coffee, though. This is the coffee. It's called From the Ground Up, and it is a combination of coffee and four nootropic or functional mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, basically. The coffee is actually very special as well. So let me tell you a little a bit about that. So it is made or grown in Colombia by women-owned and ethically operated farms. It is a uh, organic Colombian Supremo bean. However, the beans are brought to Halifax where they're locally roasted for freshness and quality control, of course. And the mushrooms themselves, most of which are grown here in Nova Scotia, some of which are still growing in Ontario, but their plan is to have all the mushrooms grown here in Nova Scotia, so it'll be a completely local product. I think that is really a special story. But that's all well and good, but how does it taste? Well, the easiest thing to do is to let's make some and then we'll give it a taste test. All right, my kettle is just off of the boil. Let's put some coffee together. So I'm using my GSI Infinity French press today, which comes with a nice little GSI Infinity cup. And uh, all right, so the coffee, obviously I didn't bring a, that bag full of coffee out today, but I transferred some of it into a little container. I do want you to see this. We're gonna talk about the ingredients as we go along. I'm gonna make I've got about two tablespoons, which would be about four teaspoons. I don't know, somewhere around there. That looks pretty good, I think, for this. Pour the water in. I'm going for about two cups of water. A little slower, Mark. Maybe a little bit more than two cups of water. That should be it. Give it a stir. Put the spoon aside. Now I just want to put the lid on just to keep it warm, not to press the coffee down. You need to wait about four or five minutes for it to really brew. But I just wanted to read to you while that's doing that, the type of mushrooms that are in it, not the type, the mushrooms that are in this. So there are four, what they refer to as nootropic, which I would call functional, which is to say medicinal mushrooms. And they are shiitake, chaga, lion's mane, and turkey tail. And uh, all good mushrooms. They all have health-related benefits. Mostly they work with your immune system. Uh, she, lion's mane is especially known for its cognitive benefits, benefits, but the rest of them pretty much all have, they all have an individual flavor. Having tried them all, of course, different, separately from the coffee, they do all taste very good on their own. I especially like chaga, if you know that. But uh, let's put it together in the coffee, and in a few moments' time, I'll press it down. I'll pour it into my cup. We'll start the, the discussion we're about to have with the taste of the coffee. All right, let's do a taste test of the Hope Blooms from the ground up coffee. Oh, that is nice. Uh, very nice. I'm going to enjoy that for sure. Okay, just a couple of comments on the coffee itself. So as I mentioned, this is a Colombian Supremo bean. It's grown in Colombia. If you're not familiar, Colombian beans are on the light to medium roast scale of things. They're not a dark roast, so don't expect a very dark, rich coffee with this because that's not what Colombian beans are all about. These are a high quality bean, roasted fresh, roasted locally, so you're going to get a very fresh and high quality product for sure but it has its own flavor that you have to like and have to get used to if, if you're not used to a Colombian bean, of course. Now, what about the addition of the mushrooms? How does that impact the flavor? Because I'm sure that's what most people are wondering. Before they purchase a mushroom coffee is, what's it gonna taste like? Well, I'll tell you what I taste in this coffee. I can taste the chaga. Of the four mush mushrooms, the only one I can really identify is the chaga. I happen to like the taste of chaga. I think it pairs well with coffee in any case. So that actually accents the coffee and makes it taste a little bit better. I have had uh, turkey tail and lion's mane in shiitake. I've made them primarily in teas on their own, not necessarily put in the coffees. Honestly, I don't get much of a flavor off of any of them, but chaga, yes, it does, definitely has its own flavor, and I can detect it in the coffee, so I just wanted to put that out there. It is a good tasting coffee. Now, just before we move on to the topic of the day, 
I'm encouraging everybody to take a look at the Hope Blooms website. I have the link for it in the video description, link specifically to the From the Ground Up Coffee, but I'm encouraging you to take a look at what else they have. I would also suggest that if you want to help Hope Blooms out in their mission, that maybe you'd like to purchase some of their products. They do ship internationally, and you can support them that way. All right, I thank you for doing so. Now, let's get on to the topic of the day. Now, maybe just before we do, I want to answer the question question of the day from the last video that I put out in the uh, Hike in a Coffee series. It's the one where I showed a uh, black mark on a birch tree in the woods and I threw out some guesses, things like uh, maybe it was uh, lightning, maybe it was uh, fungus growth, maybe it was, I don't know. And I still had, don't have an answer for it, but what was entering interesting is uh, the number of suggestions that came through from people some obviously having fun with it and I appreciated that as well but no one could definitively answer the question for me uh, quite a few people though did say they thought it was a lightning strike I honestly I can't see it but maybe now do I have an opportunity to find out what it is well I will be meeting with a wildfire prevention expert next week on another topic altogether nothing related to my YouTube videos but something I do in my volunteer life and uh, I'm going to be showing the pictures to them and seeing what they think of it and if they can come up with something a bit more definitive I'll come back yet another time to share that with you all right topic of the day this should be fun batoning our knives to break wood apart into multiple pieces. At least that's the, the concept. That's why you're doing it. First off, the background for this. So I have a, a number of knife review videos out and I've had comments on a few of them recently where people have said that it wasn't necessary for me to baton the knife. That's the polite people. Other people telling me it was stupid to baton the knife. And I said, you know, it's okay. I'm a, people are certainly entitled to their opinion. I disagree with that. I'll explain why in a moment. But that's where the background for it, that's where the idea for this video came from. Strangely enough, maybe not that strange at all, I had videos starting to appear in my YouTube recommended viewing uh, list on batoning with knives and some of the vi videos were one how to baton like Dave Canterbury has a video on how to baton and other people use like a lot of the survival experts uh, people like uh, uh, Paul Kirtley and Ray Mears and Dan Wolwack from uh, Cole Crocker Bushcraft they all baton their knives right but uh, I don't want to get off track with that I just want to point it out that they all have videos where they have batoning in them so with those videos that were being recommended the two themes that seem to come up is one that is batoning is never necessary it's never necessary to use your knife to split wood apart and one video went so far as to say it is stupid to split wood with a knife I said okay challenge accepted let's have a discussion on this now this is not going to be definitive. This is a discussion starter. In fact, I'm encouraging people who have an opinion on this to put it in the comment section of this video so we can all benefit from it. I only have two things I want to say about that. First, be respectful. I don't want people calling other people stupid. You can call me stupid, that's fine, but don't call other people stupid, all right? And the second one is, if you're going to take a position, support it. If you have an argument before or against batoning, tell me why. Just don't say it is. You know what I'm saying? Support your argument. Okay. And the last thing I'll say before we get started is that this is not a how-to video. I'm not going to try to teach people how to baton a knife. There will be no demonstrations of batoning here. It's simply a discussion on my opinion around using your knife to baton wood. All right, let's get started. So first, let's talk about what is batoning. When I say batoning a knife, most people have the image of using a stick to hit the back of a knife and drive it down through a piece of wood. And yes, that is batoning. But what is it you're trying to accomplish when you baton a piece of wood? You're trying to split it into two or more pieces, right? That's all it is. It's, it's another way of splitting wood. So maybe the better question is, is it ever necessary to split wood? Well, first off, why do you want to split wood? What's, what reason would you have for splitting wood in the first place? 
there are two reasons at least that I can think of. And the first reason is for uh, preparing fuel for a fire. We'll come back to that one in a minute. And the other reason is for crafting some type of a, an implement or object out here in the woods. So basically, those of us who consider ourselves bushcrafters like to make things from wood. Whether it's a spoon or a fork, whether it's a figure four deadfall trap, whether it's a pot hook for a, a pot to hold it over a fire, or even just a tent peg, you are actually crafting something from a piece of wood. Most of those skills involve splitting larger pieces of wood into smaller pieces of wood, right? So we can accept that. Now let's go back to the fire. The question, I guess, that needs to be asked, is it ever necessary to split wood for a fire? Well, that one's a little bit harder to answer it with definitively, and I'll explain what I mean. One of the videos that I saw was somebody who had said there is never any reason to split wood or to baton wood in order to create a fire. And this is not intended to be a criticism of what they showed. Uh, I'm not arguing with that person. They have a context for what they have to say. They may well watch this video. I'd welcome a conversation with them if they do. But what they were doing or what they were saying is you don't need to split wood or baton wood in order to create a fire. Now the context was they were in a softwood forest. They were surrounded by pine trees, spruce trees, fir trees. And they were finding dead wood that they could bring break apart with their hands in order to get some smaller wood to create a fire. Absolutely. In fact, I've done that and I have a video on doing exactly that. I have a video from a couple of years ago where I simulated falling through the ice in the winter and getting cold and wet and then had to create an emergency fire in order to survive. And in less than five minutes, I was able to break off enough small branches from the low hanging branches on the spruce trees and fir trees that were around me that, and a little bit of birch bark to get it all going that I had a good roaring fire going. Enough that would have saved my life. I say simulated because I didn't actually fall through the ice but uh, I simulated what would I do if, and I made it a very, quite a difficult challenge for myself to do. I didn't use a tool, not one, nothing to break that wood apart. Everything was done with my hands, and my hands were all, well, they were inside of mittens to make it seem a little bit more difficult. So was it necessary? Not in that circumstance, but if I was to try that in a hardwood forest where there was nothing but maples and oaks and maybe some birch and some poplar all around me, uh, that would be a lot harder. One, most of those trees don't have low hanging dead branches that I can break off and know that they are dry. I'm going to have to find dead standing or something that's laying on the ground that is still dry enough for me to use. Usually they're bigger pieces and if I'm going to make a fire from them, I have to somehow split them and get them into smaller pieces. Now, I don't always split wood for a fire. I don't want to give that impression. It's not always necessary for other reasons. If you've got a small wood stove, most of the time I can find dead wood right off of the ground or snap little twigs off of a dead tree that I can make a small fire for uh, cooking in a, fire, a wood stove. And you know, even if I'm just making a cooking fire in a fire pit, you can probably find enough dead wood around in order to make a cooking fire. But if you're actually trying to create a warming fire in the winter or a survival fire, you're gonna to have to split wood. I don't see how any way around it. I know someone's gonna say, you could just drag dead logs over the fire that you've gotten started and that will work. Maybe, as long as they're dry enough, it takes a while for wet logs to dry out enough to combust and actually add fuel to the fire. So that would be a, quite a challenge to do. Not impossible, but quite a challenge. Much more of a challenge than it would be to first, than it would be to split wood apart. So if we're talking about splitting wood, maybe the better question is, is what is the right tool for splitting wood? So let me put the, 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 my thoughts for it on this. If it's the winter time, and I'm looking to create a big fire, and I'm looking to split down big pieces of wood, my tool of choice is an ax. Why would I choose anything other than an ax or a hatchet? Primarily an ax, a good size ax at that. That's what I'll choose to split large pieces of wood down. But if I'm splitting smaller pieces of wood down, something maybe three, four inches in diameter, something maybe uh, 10 to 20 inches in length, do I need to use an ax for that? An ax can make it easier, maybe, if you brought an ax with you. But do you need an ax to do that? Well, my contention is, is that no, you don't need an ax. You don't have to use an ax for that. You can use a knife, the right knife. And that's what this is all about. 
Would I use a Mora clipper to split down that size piece of wood, three inches in diameter, 10, 20 inches in length, or 10, we'll say 10 to 15 inches in length? No, I wouldn't. A Mora clipper is not built for that type of work. But I have a lot of knives that have five, six, eight, and 10 inch blades. That's, a, that's exactly what they were built for doing. They were built for chopping and splitting. Those knives are designed specifically for processing wood. That's what they're all about. Does it make sense to use those knives to split that size wood? It makes a lot of sense to me because I prefer to use a knife in those circumstances rather than carry an ax. And it makes a lot of sense for other people as well. And I'll tell you the reason why. An ax is a wonderful tool. I have axes, I love my axes, I enjoy using them. I don't bring them out as often as I might because I just don't have a need for the power that they have when you wield them. And Here's the thing, they require training and experience in order for them to be effective and safe. So if you put an ax in the hand of an untrained person, you're asking for the potential or for an injury to occur. And not just any injury, usually quite a severe injury. That's not to say that you couldn't hurt yourself with a big knife, but the chances are that if you were, the injury is going to be less severe with a large knife than it would be with an ax. So I would sooner hand somebody with and give them basic instruction on how to use a knife to split wood than try to teach them very quickly how to use an ax to split wood. I hope that makes sense what I'm saying there. So it's still a matter of matching the tool to the job. What is the right tool for splitting the wood apart? Maybe you don't need either and you still want to split wood. Well, I actually have a video where I split woods using a folding knife. Now, I know people are cringing. I didn't actually split the wood all the way through with my folding knife. What I did is use the folding knife to create, uh, craft a wedge, use the knife to start a little line across the top of the piece of the wood, and then baton the wedge through. And that's a legitimate skill, right? So you can do that. Point being is I still split wood because I needed the wood to be split in order to use it. So it's entirely logical to split wood. Do you always have to split wood for a fire? Um, I don't know that you need it for a cooking fire, but if you want a warming fire or survival fire, I just don't know how you're going to get around that. So as I mentioned a minute ago. Now, does it make sense to use your knife all the time? Of course not. It doesn't make sense. If you've got an axe, you're skilled with an axe, then use your axe. Can you use a knife for splitting wood? Absolutely, if it's the right knife and for the right tool, the right design for the job. And that's what I'm going to say about it. So, should, here maybe the question I want to ask in closing out is, should people learn how to split with a knife? Should it be a required skill of every outdoors person? And my answer to that is yes. Everybody should know how to split wood with a knife, regardless of how often they want to do it. It is a tool in your toolbox. You should know how to split wood with your knife. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say on the topic. Again, I'm inviting people to put their comments, their opinions in the comment section below. Again, be respectful and support your point of view in the comment as well. But if you have anything else you wanna put in the comment section, any questions, then put that there as well. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.